Hello, good afternoon. I am very pleased to be joining you today to talk about how to navigate office politics. My name is Katie Koba. I am a resource manager at Robert Half. Uh, what that means is really a fancy word for a recruiter. I meet candidates, uh, many candidates, on a weekly basis to interview them, help them with their job search skills, and help to find them, uh, or excuse me, help to find opportunities that align with their background and interests. So, like I said, I'm here today to talk to you about navigating office politics. So, unlike presidential politics, office politics know no season. Politics doesn't just gear up every four years during the campaign trail, but rather oftentimes makes frequent appearances in our everyday workplace. Today, we're going to discuss how office politics can affect you, because no matter the size of the company that you join or are already in, some form of politics is likely at play. So I know many of you are just starting your careers, but you would be very hard pressed to find a professional out there who hasn't had a brush with office politics at some point during their career. So while politics may seem best avoided altogether, writer George Orwell says, in our age, there's no such thing as keeping out of politics. The same holds true today, and even though Orwell may have been talking about governmental politics at the time, the sentiment can also be applied to the workplace. In fact, here is what professionals are saying. According to a recent Robert Half survey, more than 60% of workers polled believe some involvement in office politics is either very or somewhat necessary to get ahead. To break that down even further, 17% said it was very necessary to get ahead. Uh, and 45% said somewhat necessary to get ahead. Uh, both students and those already working full-time need to understand that this is an unavoidable but often undiscussed aspect of participating in business and office environments. Uh, and although we focus on office scenarios, you'll see throughout um, this presentation that many of these situations apply in, in many different settings, including our educational environments, uh, business, and then also in our social lives. So to advance your career, um, there may be times when you have to become more involved in office politics than you might like or be comfortable with. And, and why is that? So there's a few key reasons. One being is probably the, the biggest is to protect yourself. And by that I mean to protect your work and your reputation. To get buy-in for your ideas, to know how to deal with other political players because I guarantee you're going to run into them. And to avoid getting stepped on by colleagues as they climb the corporate ladder. Everyone has different motivators when they enter the workplace. Uh, some people are money motivated, some people uh, are driven by work-life balance, some people are motivated by fulfilling and rewarding work or work that contributes to the community. So it's really important to learn how to interact with all these players. And I want to take things one step further. Uh, choosing to avoid office politics completely could actually hurt your career. Um, so even though you may not relish in office politics, a simple understanding of just your company's political landscape is going to be really important to your career advancement, no matter what your goals are. So if you're wondering just how often people actually take part in office politics, we covered this in our survey as well. So uh, another Robert Half survey asked workers um, to share their degree of involvement in office politics. 14% uh, said they were an active campaigner, meaning they had to play the game to get ahead. And 40% said they were occasional voters, meaning they get involved when issues become important to them. So that's more than half uh, of people that were surveyed that are either actively involved or feel like they have to occasionally play a game of politics to get ahead. So the fact that this many workers feel they need to get involved, at least to some degree, suggests office politics plays a pretty important role in career advancement. So today we're going to talk about how you can become more politically savvy at work, how to build coalitions that can help you be more productive and enhance your career. We're going to discuss how to navigate the oftentimes murky waters of office politics and avoid getting caught up in negative political situations. It's a fine balance uh, that you need to achieve when addressing these issues. So the key to navigating office politics is to build and nurture relationships throughout your organization. The more you work collaboratively with others, the more they can help you in return. 
So the best employees understand the dynamics of the organization and they know that you can't operate in a vacuum in order to be successful. It involves working with others on your team, in your department, faculty, program, um, and with colleagues in other departments. You know, obviously when you join a company, everyone is there to service an external client of some sort. And yes, those business relationships are important, but I would argue that those that you build internally uh, are as important, if not potentially more important in terms of getting ahead um, or, you know, moving your career in the direction you'd like it to go. If you can build credibility with your internal colleagues, um, it's going to help you go a long way in your career. So when you join a new company, it's really important to build those relationships and learn a little bit about your business group. Um, is it competitive or supportive? Is it traditional or do they work pretty innovatively? Um, are they results oriented, process oriented, team oriented, individual oriented? Um, so the tone is often set at the top of the organization and then filters throughout. So you should be able to get pretty quick answers to these types of questions when you join an organization just by talking to other internal resources. And it's important to understand your company's values because these drive a lot of the political undercurrents and the behaviors uh, that you might encounter. So while many people don't enjoy playing office politics, it's still important to know who the key players are in the organization. So these people obviously include your manager, your manager's assistant if they have one, or anyone who would be directly supporting your manager or serve as a gatekeeper to your manager. Uh, who the C-level and executive level leadership are, uh, and their assistants as well. So the assistants are often the gatekeepers to key executives. In fact, there's just no way executives could keep up with the volume of communication that they receive throughout the day. So uh, executive assistants um, are often kind of the first line of review for any requests coming in. So getting to know them um, is key and never underestimate their power and their influences. So tech support or other professionals who can help you be more effective in your role are also important to know. It might be someone in accounting uh, who runs regular reports for you or your HR representative who helps with staffing issues. Um, get to know these individuals and how to best work with them. Give everyone the same consideration you would expect from others. Kind of the golden rule here. It's not only important to know these individuals, but also to understand their work styles. For example, how do they like to be communicated to or with? Do they prefer email? Do they prefer you just pick up the phone? Are they more available in the morning, the afternoon? Do they like small talk or do they just need you to get to the point? Do they want you to back up your suggestion with valid reasons? These are, this is all good information that you can gather when joining an organization by building those internal relationships. Also, how often do they want updates? Uh, some people don't like to keep, be kept guessing and want regular status updates or they need constant reassurance that a project is running smoothly, even if there are no new updates. Others are less formal and may only require periodic check-ins. So getting to know what's expected of you in terms of updates uh, will be important uh, to leading a smooth project. Um, what are their hot buttons? What issues or projects elicit a strong emotional response? Understanding what's important to these people and, prior, and being able to prioritize your workload uh, accordingly is absolutely necessary. What may seem less important to you may be a top priority for your manager uh, or even the person above them. So understanding what those pain points and priorities are should help you to clarify what your priorities should be. And finally, what do they need from you? How does your role relate to theirs? What can you provide better, faster, more frequently? If you don't know the answer to these questions, just ask. People appreciate uh, your natural curiosity and wanting to know. So office politics becomes more important as you start to move up the ranks. So you've now gained some experience, you're looking at that next role, uh, and you start to have greater influence and others start to look at you as either a peer leader or an actual, you know, people manager, um, and they start to look for you for guidance. Uh, you need to be able to influence others, and that's where your relationship and relationships and team dynamics come more into play. So basically, at the end of the day, office politics will be, only become more important 
not less, the further up the career ladder you go. In fact, promotions may be tied to your ability to effectively navigate through tricky situations at work. So we've got some tips to guide you, and I want to spend a few minutes on some political lessons for professionals. Lesson number one, keep it clean by avoiding smear campaigns. What do we mean by that? Sometimes office politics can be a dirty business. Uh, the key to rising above negativity is to identify those motives uh, and respond appropriately. So to do this, just avoid giving in to any quote unquote mudslinging um, or blame. There shouldn't be any finger pointing uh, in any situation. Uh, be accountable for the parts of the product that you own and hold others accountable, uh, but there's no place for blame. Uh, stick to the facts. Don't make things personal. Don't malign someone's character to make yourself look good. Uh, it will really only make you look bad, and I guarantee it'll come back to bite you. So leave the smear campaigns for the professional politicians. Keep it clean. Keep it about the work and the task at hand. Take note of political undercurrents in the office by keeping tabs on office news, but not getting involved in the gossip. So they call it water cooler talk. Um, I don't, our office doesn't have a water cooler, but uh, it's the break room, it's the hallway, it's anywhere else that uh, employees gather to just discuss work. Um, sometimes it's key projects, sometimes it's venting their frustrations. But while it can sometimes yield useful information, you have to know which conversations to tune into and which to politely excuse yourself from. Separate what's actual news and uh, rollouts from gossip and avoid any conversation that could polarize your coworkers against you. You'll want to pay attention to any career-related talks, uh, like discussions about job cuts or possible new positions. Lesson number three, observe and respect established nuances of everyday life in the office. Uh, learn what's not in the company handbook. Study office behavior and protocol. Observe how things are done, how to handle certain individuals and situations. Avoid breaching unwritten rules, unspoken chains of command. So this is just, you know, what's not blatantly laid out uh, in terms of a handbook, but what's generally accepted in the workplace. Lesson number four, resolve conflicts quickly. Um, settle small squabbles before they turn into big conflicts. Don't address issues with colleagues when upset or frustrated. Focus on facts, not feelings, and acknowledge when you're wrong. One thing I'd like to add to this list is always discuss conflicts at the appropriate level. So if you have an issue or a conflict with your peer, be sure to always address that issue directly with that peer first before escalating uh, up to any levels of management because guess what their first question to you is going to be? Have you addressed it with them? Uh, you don't want to appear like a cattle tail uh, and you want to instill confidence that you are comfortable with conflict and can handle issues at the peer level head on. Lesson number five. Connect to the people. Uh, so why are politicians uh, so often photographed shaking hands and talking with people? Uh, well, it makes sense, um, it, or excuse me, it makes them seem accessible uh, and interested. More likely to win votes if they don't feel connected on a personal level. So you really need to ensure that you're engaging in small talk uh, in order to have a, a bigger payoff. Uh, build that credibility, I would call it. Build that trust with your colleagues. Show them that you're more interested uh, beyond just the task at hand. So important, what, to summarize, uh, it's important to develop well-rounded relationships with fellow team members. Get to know them on a personal level. Um, you know, being talented will get you so far. Good interpersonal skills take you the rest of the way, and it's true. Uh, simply put, small talk can help you win really big. Um, so expressing interest in coworkers' lives strengthens connections and makes them feel valued. Now that we've discussed strategies for becoming a good office politician, now let's look at some of the activities that give office politics a bad name. 
So there are these are some of the more prevalent political activities in the workplace, according to a recent Robert Half poll um, of over 400 workers. 54% gossiping or spreading rumors, 20% gaining favor by flattering the boss, 17% taking credit for others' work, um, sabotaging coworkers' projects and other make up the other 90% or 9%, excuse me. This slide makes me feel like we didn't come that far from high school. Um, you'll see a lot of recurring themes throughout your life here. It's alarming, isn't it, how even in professional organizations, gossiping accounts for almost half of the most common behavior. I'd like you to take a moment uh, and think about your own work or classroom situations. Can you think of any peers, fellow students, coworkers who fall into these categories? Are there any behaviors not mentioned that you think should be included? Although involvement in office politics is necessary to advance, if taken to extremes, it can have opposite effects. This is where finesse comes into play. So let's take a look at a field guide to some more outrageous political players in your office, tips on how to deal with them and how to avoid becoming one. So with gossip playing such a huge role in office politics, Remember the results of the survey we just looked at. Most of you are probably familiar with the telltale body language signals that alert you when office gossip is probably taking place. You've got bowed heads, hunched shoulders, people talking closely together, covering their mouths, giving you know glances. While it seems harmless, even the most seemingly innocuous gossip can seriously undermine integrity and morale of the of everything from social circles, school project groups, and definitely in the office. So as I mentioned earlier, water cooler talk can sometimes yield useful information, but knowing when to hang around the water cooler and when not to is going to be key to avoid becoming involved in the office gab fest. So when should you leave? If someone needs to hide behind a file folder to say something, you probably don't need to hear it. Rule number one, avoid talk that focuses on juicy office intrigue, speculation, things that can only be spoken about in hushed tones. Again, probably not news you want to be involved in anyway. Stay away from conversation center on coworkers' personal lives or what they're doing on the weekend. It's also wise to avoid topics like religion, politics of the non-office variety, or other talk that can cause friction um, or possibly even escalate to heated arguments. Like water cooler talk, self-promotion shouldn't be avoided altogether, but there is a right way and wrong way to go about doing it. So how it should not be done. Anybody recognize the credit thief? Uh, it's the person that comes in and steals all the glory. So she claims more than half her fair share of credit on team projects, except no responsibility when things go wrong. So how do you deal with these people? One, protect yourself. <laughs> Keep written records of your contributions. This includes setting up a file for any emails that were set out that you maybe drafted or put together about the project plan. Um, and it's appropriate to correct misperceptions when necessary. Uh, stand up for yourself. Again, this is all about protecting yourself and your reputation. And how should you do that? Um, there are ways you can gain visibility without boasting, bragging, staying humble. Try periodically keeping your manager just updated on some of your key successes and contributions. And then be able to quantify the contributions in a report. So being able to say, my efforts on this project led to X in results. Um, being able to link your efforts to the impact on final results is a great way to differentiate yourself. Next, um, I don't know how many of you should have watched the TV show Mad Men. Um, you probably know the guy like Pete Campbell in the show. He's smooth, he's slippery. Um, and the Pete Campbells are known outside of the world of TV as the psycho fans. So curious about this type of person? Uh, for this person, flattery is a weapon of choice uh, to integrate with the higher up flagrantly stoking egos of anyone perceived to be in a position of power, has little time or respect for underlings uh, or people who are down in the trenches. So take heed if this individual suddenly shifts their attitude towards you. This newfound attention may signal that you're being set up for a one-sided failure. 
what, or excuse me, one-sided favor, what are they going to get out of it? And then nextly, next is also a Pete Campbell type uh, with a broader spectrum of ulterior motives. Um, this individual is a double agent in the office, so they specialize in sabotage rather than hard work uh, to get ahead. So seems like a team player on the surface, but really they're only looking out for number one. Uh, these people can be very hard to identify at first, um, but then show up at key times, like in meetings or key presentations. Uh, they try to make themselves look good by making others look bad, and this could be just a subtle gesture of not standing up for somebody in a group setting, um, and they manipulate people, um, causing antagonism by pitting coworkers against each other. So if you think that you recognize these traits in a colleague, it's best to keep your guard up and just maintain a safe distance. Next is the debater. The debater needs no one else's input but his or her own, lobbies relentlessly for a personal agenda. So the most notable attributes of somebody in this category, uh, one, there's probably the person in the office who slices up your good ideas like a master chef. Uh, they're passionate about their own projects, but much less enthused about anybody else's, um, thinks that their way of doing things is the only way. Advocates or supports no one else's projects or ideas, and thinks there is some hidden I in teamwork, as in, I am always right. Uh, if this sounds familiar, uh, you know, be aware when working on team projects with a debater uh, that you really want to recognize when they're pushing a certain agenda and be able to stand up for yourself and your own ideas, and just don't be strong-armed by their cell taxes excuse me, their cell tactics. Uh, present your ideas so that the debater thinks it could be his or her own. So now that you have an idea of how to deal with office politics, it's important to consider how important soft skills are in an overall office setting. Um, when we interviewed uh, some workers in a recent Robert Half survey, it averaged out to more than 8 in 10, or around 85%, said that being courteous to others has an impact on a person's career prospects. So repeated etiquette or communication breaches show a lack of attention to detail or common courtesy. This can cause others to perceive you as unprofessional and potentially affect your prospects for career advancement. So here are the key soft skills employers are looking for. The first, collaboration, leadership, whether at the peer level or actually as a people leader, uh, strong written and verbal communication, flexibility, as well as initiative. So I'd like to discuss each one in greater detail, beginning with collaboration. So the ability to work well with others is pivotal in a team setting where you'll interact with people at all levels of an organization and in other disciplines uh, and professions. So in this context, you must utilize skills such as diplomacy, tact, uh, and negotiation. You must be willing to let others lead and be able to listen actively with an open mind to new ideas and new way of doing things. And just as there will be times you'll have a supporting role in the team, there will be other instances when you'll be leading an initiative or supervising a team of coworkers on a project. So want to talk about leadership. In those cases, you'll need to tap some key leadership skills to motivate coworkers and guide the team to success. You'll need a big picture perspective to anticipate the needs of the company and conceptualize the solutions. Effective leadership is also based on an understanding of the company's business objectives and priorities. So as a leader, you'll be called upon to find solutions. In a survey we conducted, 34% of CFOs said that problem-solving abilities impress them most when hiring candidates. As it relates to written and verbal communications, um, you must be able to effectively um, kind of explain complex data, complex 
compliance requirements, um, and make suggestions and offer solutions, both verbally and in writing, to senior management and diverse audiences in the company. Uh, I deal with this a lot when I work with HR professionals who are going through systems implementations, for example. Um, you know, when you're trying to communicate between an IT department and an HR department, there's a lot that can get lost in translation. So having somebody who can understand and interpret very technical communication and then summarize it for a non-technical audience is a great skill set. Um, it can make you a differentiator in the workplace. Uh, the importance of strong communication skills are reinforced by this statistic. More than one-third of CFOs said it was the most impressive characteristic when they were interviewing job candidates. Next is flexibility. So uh, another key characteristic in today's competitive business environment. Um, this is valued by 35% of the CFOs who surveyed who said the ability to adapt to change is going to be necessary for success. Um, so to cultivate greater flexibility, try to view change as an opportunity, not an obstacle or a threat. You know, they're looking for the way that you adapt to change because change is inevitable. So while it's good to be adaptable to changes when they occur, it's even better to proactively bring about the change when it'll benefit your company. So, for example, if you determine that a new process would save time and money, propose the change to management and lead the way. Um, offer to be collaborative with different departments on the project. I would caution, though, that it's important that you have done the necessary work of building credibility internally and with your team before you start to drive significant change related to process. Next is initiative. Uh, there is increased demand for candidates who can step into a new position and immediately assume ownership of their project. Um, so, making initiative a, a high, highly sought after attribute. Uh, so, the ability, some of the buzzwords you'll hear, is step in with little runway or ramp up time. Um, being able to make an immediate impact. So, employees can show initiative by being proactive in finding resources and solutions to company challenges, by proposing innovative approaches or more efficient ways of doing the job, uh, by alerting leaders of when there are issues or developments, such as new reporting requirements that could impact the company. Being able to anticipate future problems and avoid them altogether is a great way to, to stand out. Sometimes it's easier to explain how to do something right by showing how it shouldn't be done. That's why Robert Half created the Don't Let This Happen to You video series. Uh, our newest set is on guess what, office politics. <laughs> With these videos, you can see the types of mistakes that could derail your career progression. The image in the slide is from a video in the series, the one is called The Promotion. You can view all of our Don't Let This Happen to You videos at roberthalf.com backslash bloopers. That concludes our discussion on navigating office politics. Thank you for your time, and I hope you found this information helpful. I very much enjoy being able to present with you today. If you do have any questions that arise, my contact information is listed there, and please feel free to reach out. Thanks so much.